we have uh, the pleasure to uh, hear uh, Paolo Zaffaroni talk about factor models. Um, Paolo is a uh, professor of financial econometrics at uh, Imperial College Business School in London. Uh, he's written quite extensively on factor models, so I'm really looking forward to his talk today. Um, his discussant is also someone who's wor worked quite a bit on factor models, so this is really going to be an exciting exchange. Uh, discussing this, uh, Patrick Gagliardini from uh, Swiss Italian University in Lugano, Switzerland. I'm not going to pronounce that in Italian because you, both of you guys are going to make fun of me. <laughs> um, uh, I suggest that uh, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat um, and we will answer some of the questions uh, at the end. Um, after the presentation by Paolo and the discussion by uh, Patrick. Uh, after uh, an, the hour, we will end the recording and uh, we will have an informal uh, discussion among those who want to stay on for the, that discussion. Uh, Paolo, it's all yours. Uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation on factor models uh, conditional in the conditional setting, which is uh, the topic. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, actually, you know, to you know, Eric and Brian and Katia and Dasheng for this opportunity, and especially having like the honor of having Patrick as a discussion. This is like truly uh, a treasure uh, for me, given the topic, as you just said. Okay, so let me just share the screen. Okay. Uh, all right, I'll be making 35 minutes. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Given the audience, I'm probably going to give you a no, maybe a good slow on the overview and a bit of highlights on the on the on the theory. There is a lot of stuff in the empirical part, but maybe I'll just highlight some part part of it. Okay. So so as uh, you, know, you said, this is like is a, is a paper that actually shows how to use in the simplest possible way, you know, uh, sort of latent factor models for other things conditional as surprising. Okay, so, so what is the big picture, the problem that I'm tackling? Uh, okay, not to tell to this audience that linear factor asset pricing model are the workhorse uh, in empirical finance, empirical asset pricing. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, is, uh, you know, who are these pricing factors? And so I'm talking about the zoo, the zoo problem here, okay? And, you know, the approach I'm taking here uh, uh, is uh, forget about looking for the right guy, let's go latent. So then I'm simply going to sort of try to span the space of latent factors uh, 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 that are driving, you know, uh, my asset pricing model. The second question I'm going to address is, you know, how can I use this in a conditional setting? Um, and, and the problem is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the difficulty in, in the conditional setting is that very often we have to make assumptions. Uh, for example, say, you know, Patrick has, you know, a great paper on conditional risk premia uh, and, and, you know, and, you know, and so forth. And there are many, many other papers uh, and, and, you know, on, in, this, in, in, this, in this topic. And the question, for example, typically you choose some state variables, uh, you choose some, you know, some functional form, uh, and then you, you carry on. The problem is that, you know, these are very tractable, but, you know, Hansen and Sarge reminded us that with tractability can't mean specification. And so, you know, again, I would like to have a method that is robust, not just to the choice of the risk factors, but also to the form of the conditioning, if you want. And the idea, super simple. Again, I'm just using what is super heavily used in upset pricing and empirical finance. I do estimation with short time rolling windows. Okay, so that's what you. That's what you. That's what you do. Uh, okay. So the setup of the paper is the following. So basically, I'm trying to uh, sort of uh, uh, show you, I'm going to show you a, a theory, a sort of formal international theory on uh, conditional uh, latent factor asset pricing model with no arbitrage, which is a key point actually of the, of the statistical theory that is robust to both the possible omission of risk factors and to misspecify dynamics, okay? And to, to address this, to, to allow this, I, I basically try to kind of depart from the classical uh, uh, no, uh, PCA type approach in a sense that PCA approach is typically unconditional. So everything is constant. I mean, there are some statistical developments. I will, I will mention some of them, but really is sort of an unconditional approach and it works very well if this structure is robust, if you want. 
But here I try to do actually something that's conditional. And I try to really allow almost every feature, feature of the model to be, uh, to be uh, sort of time bearing. So risk exposure is time bearing, factor risk per time bearing, factor risk are time bearing by construction, either risk can bearing, and even the number of factors, okay? And so you know, the, to, to, uh, to do that, actually, when I started to think about this problem, I revisit you know, the PCA literature, which I know fairly well, and realized actually there was a gap here. So I, I couldn't really do what I wanted to do, you know, uh, because uh, I, 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 you know, there was no theory to support it. And so in this paper, I guess I tried to make this bigger effort, perhaps, uh, to first look at the PCA theory for like what happened to PCA when you allow for large n, n is the number of assets, and t and time is, 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 is small, fixed, so for a short rolling time windows. Uh, and see, and, and then based on this, I develop my you know, statistical theory on, on for inference on 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 the on the on, on the models. And as I said, you know, one of the beauty of PCA actually that is really nice that I mean happens that PCA are weighted average of returns. So let's call the portfolios. In fact, there is a very tight relationship. People, of course, is known, but I formalize this even more. So I show actually that you can really think about this as a problem of mimicking portfolios, and it works really really well. Um, and so, as I said, like, you know, in the PCA framework, you know, every, everything is known pretty much, I mean, he heavily studied, but, you know, uh, when, you know, you fix T, well, of course, you lose, you know, you have a bit less information, so you have to pay some price in terms of biases. And, and, and so, 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 so what I show here is, my, you know, I, I show you how far you can go uh, uh, fixing T, fixing time, and just letting N large in terms of inference, it turns out that you can go actually quite far. Now there is an, an, a sort of, you know, this, this idea of doing inference with sort of, uh, you know, finitely rolling windows, you know, uh, is, is, is heavily used. I mean, I, I cited Fama Macbeth as a empirical practice, but if you go in the theory, for example, I mean, recently I realized that, you know, the forecasting musical paper of Giacomini White, that's exactly that. They, they do, you know, they, they provide this test of forecasting performance, conditional, by the way, so here is an analogy, Second, where the, the time window for estimation is fixed and the average over the number of forecasting periods. Here, I do pretty much the same by averaging across assets. And my interest perhaps is a bit more ambitious. I mean, not that it's not important, just look at the T-stat of, of this premium is super useful, but maybe I really want to see what is the economic bite of my model. So how can I make inference of the stochastic scan factor? And what is the pricing ability of that? So can I make inference of that despite the fact that T is fixed. And of course, once you talk about SDF, you can flip the dual problem of portfolio of mean bias portfolio. And so this means that my methodology is going to add this potentially also, also that. And so the solution, as I said, will be I present first a novel asymptotic distribution theory for PCA when n is large it is fixed. So this in a way holds regardless of the asset pricing framework. Uh, and, 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 and then I sort of uh, implement it into my, into my framework. And the insights are the following. So, so what you have to realize is that there is a kind of dichotomy here. So when you after the factors, N matters, but not T. And when you after the risk exposure, the loadings, T matters, but not N, okay? Um, so that's the first key observation. Uh, the second observation is that certain, well, perhaps most of the quantitative interest in, in asset pricing, say risk premium and SDF, really depends just on the risk factors. So this means that we have now like a, a, a trajectory Towards inference on these quantities that in a way is independent of, of, of T. And, and, and moreover, of course, the loadings uh, and other quantities do matter and uh, do enter, for example, in various, in various way in, 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 in my approach, in my methodology, but they enter, then that's also another key observation in terms of averaging, okay? So in terms of if you want portfolios. And so even though you know I might have a very, no, I'm gonna have a biased estimate which is of the loadings, which is biased forever because, uh, because T is fixed. When you average, you get a consistent estimate of the moments of these quantities. And these are the, 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 the moments are the quantities that matters for inference, again, on uh, risk premium and SDF. And so, and so what will you achieve, Ria? What will you achieve if you want, I call it the Oracle property. You achieve, when N is large, the same estimate that they would achieve if you had the magic wand, you could observe the through risk factors, but you don't because they're latent, and moreover, robust to misspecification in the conditional dynamics. Okay, so that's what you do. So, 
Uh, I mean, this is part of my larger research agenda on large gen. I have se several work, some, some are more statistical than others. I mean, Eric was very kind enough to, to mention my pure factor model. So that's, you know, I'm working a lot on this and I did a lot, but they also have some more asset pricing, you know, again, uh, large gen uh, asset pricing sort of uh, theory papers. Uh, think about the APT, I'll mention this in a second. And so, 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 so I'm very fascinated by this cross-sectional sort of you know, uh, analysis, which is kind of ironic because I started my career as like a sort of hardcore time series, long memory, uh, say, you know, comp super complicated stuff. And now I, I'm flipping and just do say, I go very simple, very mild on the time series that dimension and then really go more sort of deeper and articulated in the large uh, end dimension. Anyway, so it really justified thousands of assets traded like, you know, uh, you know, every point in time, we are, and practitioners are very reluctant to look at, at long time series because for many different reasons, you know, stu you know structural breaks, non stationarity. Sometimes you just, you know, sometimes the asset were not there. I mean, we, now, you know, we study Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, the cross section are huge, the time series is small. And so, you know, these are, I think, good reason to focus on this sort of sampling scheme. And of course, even the theory tells us that actually large N is important. I mean, even the CAPM is founded on the idea of full diversification of idiosyncratic risk, which actually is achieved when N is large. And so anyway, I mean, there are three literature I'm kind of touching. Uh, so one is the PCA, let's say PCA in asset pricing. And there is no, I mean, I kind of split in a theory part and an empirical part, and you know, I put in, in, I highlight the ones which are really, really closest to me. So the work of course of Patrick and the work of, of, of Marcus uh, as well. And then there is the conditional surprise literature. And again, you know, if, allow me to sort of split the two into parts. So one is using state variables and one is so non-parametric and, you know, and that's the one I, I'm looking at. So, you know, these are the sort of cup and paper of, 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 of Stephen Nagel and Llewellyn and then the Anne Christensen again, you know, uh, paper. In that respect, and then you know, of course, a lot of the work uh, um, in that respect, and then finally, of course, the classical PCI synthetics. So, as I said, tons of work in large and large T, but in fixed T, very, very uh, little work. I mean, there are the two. I mean, most important paper probably are, are these ones here. Uh, so, Connor Grazi had this idea; they, they sort of realized that actually you could do inference on the on the factors and 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 by kind of formalize some of some of the some of the claim. And so, basically, what I do here, I join you no know, and try to advance i joined the, the, the sort of notion of those three issues and i try to advance this addressing this issue in uh, in larger another angle if you want if you're if you're familiar with the chamberlain chamberlain rothschild papers these beautiful apt papers their papers are very blending the notion of population apt uh in without without surprising uh, uh with large n and if you want my paper is about the sampling properties of the of of, of, of pca Again, in a large and asset pricing. So, if you want, it's a sample counterpart of, of, of Chamberlain, the Chamberlain Rothschild. Okay, so let me just scroll through. So, this is the setup. So, you know, we have like, we observe a large cross section of, 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 of excess returns. I, go to ex I can extend it to the situation when the risk free is not traded. So, that's no problem. Actually, it has some nice theoretical implication. But, you know, for, for the sake, let's talk about just excess returns. So, the risk free is traded. We have a model like this. We have an intercept, not specified, and then we have some uh, com sort of little factors, little ft. Uh, there are r t minus one of them, so they can you know, change over time the number of them with some loading lambda. And everything is conditional, as you see, you know, in that respect, theoretically speaking. A key point here is that I'm going to, you know, unlike the usual, you know, uh, sort of PCA analysis, but very much like the Chamberlain and the Chamber Rothschild. I'm going to, to sort of uh, sort of leverage on the non arbitrage because once you have no arbitrage, you have some sort of change of measure, and then you can rewrite the model from the previous one, like in the sort of red equation, where now you kind of shift the latent factors, the little f, and they become the big f, where you sort of re 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 change the mean, so reset the mean, so that now the mean of of the big f are exactly the risk premium. They, and also the other implication is that the intercept are now the little a, let's call them pricing errors, okay? I mean, they, they, sometimes they're actually more important than that, but you know, these are the things that the APT tell us that we can basically ignore. Uh, and so, but why this is important is because, uh, uh, is, actually this is super key, uh, is a, probably one of the biggest inside of the paper, like because the little a, they satisfy the no arbitrary constraint, meaning they are small when the frustration is large, 
I can run this machinery without the meaning. And this is important because by uh, sort of show us that if you start to uh, demean, they of course introduce temporal, uh, temporal uh, um, uh, uh, dependence and temporal dependence might essentially kill the, the asymptotics. And so I would not demean the data. In a way, I, I really careful in extracting as much information as I can from the first moment. This is the key, key point, okay? Departure, if you want, from other approaches of PCA in asset price uh, uh, when you have large and large T, okay? Now, this slide is just about the fact that, on the other hand, if you have fixed T, there is an identification issue, meaning, again, this is like coming from Schenken 92, the celebrated paper uh, shows that actually, you know, you can identify not the gamma, the usual risk premium, but a sort of perturbed version of gamma, which is the, he called the exposed risk premium, which is, what, which, you know, in our, in using my notation, turns out to, to be equal to the F bar, the sample mean of the F. And that's, you know, that's, that is my object of inference. Now, we can discuss whether, you know, okay, you know, this is really not gamma, there is a perturbation, but the question I think is more important is like, does it have like some sort of economic added value? Is it useful? Does it matter? Can we price assets? And I think I have like a, a, a positive answer, a solid positive answer to that, okay? Uh, now, in terms of SDF, again, I follow the path and I say, okay, this is the first line is the SDF, classical SDF under like a factor structure. Now, you know, and you know, because it's the correct, uh, the correct specification, you get pricing error, like you should, which are kind of zero. I mean, there is a little bit of little A there, but let's say there's zero. Now, in a fixed T, you can identify the ex post SDF, let me call it this way, which is the second equation. Now, how useful is of pricing? So again, another cool feature here. The SDF matters because it used to average the payoff. And so this means that if you do the maths, you induce pricing error of the order of one over T, not one over square root of T, which is the usual statistical sort of discrepancy, right? And so anyway, that is our object of interest. Remember, our goal is to get what you would get if you had the magic wand and you could really see and observe the, the factors. Okay, so that's really sort of the setup. So let me show you how we estimate this, this, this work, okay? So first, as I said, I'm going to go very quickly here. This is just PCA, okay? So I kind of dress it as a sort of local PCA. You know, you can interpret as a kernel PCA estimator. You can do that. But remember, well, one thing is important. This is not a high frequency setting. T is fixed, you're allowed to, you can use it to low frequency as low as you want. So, so, so even though numerically, you know, if you do sort of kernel PCA, you get the same number, statistically it, it will be, it will be quite different. Okay, so you get the F tilde are, the, are our, you know, the, the factors, which are the rescaled eigenvectors, lambda tilde are the OLS, you know, projection, which are the, 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 the factor exposure. And then, you know, uh, natural, the natural estimator, well, there are two of them actually for the risk premia is, just the sample mean of the F. Remember the F, the big F are, you know, change, they have a change of measure because of no arbitrage. So they are centered around the risk premium. So of course the sample mean is a great estimator. But I think what is really cool is that if you want to be really say, you no know, sort of kind of as surprising driven and say, no, I'm going to do the two pass regression. Well, the two pass gives you an identical solution to the problem. And that's because of, you know, it's a byproduct of the orthogonality that is inherited by PCA. Okay, so no demeaning, you just do two pass and, and you get the same estimator. And then once you got the estimator for this premium and then you got the estimates of the factors, it's easy to you know, plug in uh, into the formula for this DF and we have our estimated exposed SDF. One word of notice, of course, this DF is invariant to the rotation. The risk premium is not invariant to rotation. So you have to bear in mind, and this will, will cause some, some, some thoughts about when we think about interpret the result in a dynamic setting. Okay, so anyway, so let me just, this is just the PCA, so let me just keep that. Uh, one thing which is important here, just to remind ourselves that, you know, because T is fixed, the F will be consistent for like, for a rotation of the F, uh, the lambda will not be. So you get this part here. But if you take averages, so you take the mean of the lambda tilde, the, S, the bar of the lambda tilde, you can recover this if N is large. And that is cool because this allows us to, to, to do inference. Now, to, of course, to implement this, we go to know how many factors. And here I have a result which shows that you can consistently estimate the number of factors in a time varying setting. You just need to kind of be a bit uh, sort of thoughtful about the penalization. I'm just using really borrowing the buy-in setup, but you know, 
because of the T is fixed, you, you cannot use that, that proof sadly. So I need to sort of correct this somehow for, for, for that. And again, this is this slide is just remind us that there is a rotation, but you know, we are in a time bearing setting. So the rotation, if you want, there are two rotations. There is the classical plus minus one rotation, and there is which is fixing the sign, and there is a mind to rotation. And uh, it turns out that you know we can identify, well, we need to identify really, you know, the the J, the, the, the sign rotation. And then for the for the blue rotation, for the for the magnitude, we can actually, you know, there is an idea in, here in, in Marcus' paper, and I kind of build on that. And actually you can you can anchor this time series of rotation to a single unknown rotation. So we, in a way we can map it back to the study framework so you can interpret the time series of, of estimated factors in a, in a changing environment. And then, you know, okay, inference, this is like the properties of uh, the stream estimator. You can see the rotation matrix popping up here, you know, root and consistent, you know, asymptotic normal, um, uh, uh, et cetera. You can estimate the you know, standard errors. That's what I do here. Uh, same story for the SDF. So again, SDF uh, will be uh, root and consistent estimated for the exposed SDF. And then, you know, again, asymptotically, asymptotically uh, normal. So that's, uh, that's, um, a school okay you blah, 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 some stuff about again how to estimate the quadrant matrix uh, uh oh sorry the, the, the value in this case because it's a scalar quantity uh but you know again you know the, the key point here is that you know just to highlight you know for example you know there are quantities which depends on 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 on, on the loadings please exposure but because which i'm not able to estimate you know, consistently i have an unbiased estimate but it's noisy but I, what the distribution requires is the is the um, is the the moments of the of the of the loadings. At that, I can do it. Okay. What really I think is cool here. My really interest is on this part here. Okay. Uh, so here I want to see I want to see if I can build some sort of uh, a sort of statistical analysis to see how this approach works in practice for the purpose that we use this model for, which is I would say no. Let's simplify two main reasons. A, we want to feed the cross-section of spectral return. So that's a classical sort of test that we use for asset pricing models. Um, and that's the first part. And so, for example, I call delta the pricing error of, you know, coming from fitting the cross-section of spectral return. And the delta, you know, I'm assuming the following. So I know under correct specification, you can show that zero. And, uh, and here, uh, it, when they're not zero, I'm, I'm assuming that this happens. So basically, the average square delta is bounded away from zero, which is uh, deviation you know, of, from correct specification. Uh, and I'm going to show you how you know how my, how my procedure works, you know, in terms of this deviation. And 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 the second is I want to see how is pricing my assets. So let me call H the pricing error from prices. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that of course under correct specified. These prices, these, these deviations are really small in a large cross section. And you know, if it's misified, they're not small. Of course, in theory, those price scenarios are related. One is the scale version of the other. Uh, in practice, is, is not at all like this. So numerically, they are no, they're quite they could be quite 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 different. So I need to do like a different uh, treatment for for or different analysis for those two for those two quantities. Um, okay, so anyway, so 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 next, so, so let, if, if now. Looking at the at the pricing error, for example, for the uh, expected return pricing error, you can see again that because this is fixed, even if model is correct, even if the theoretical standard error is going to zero, the 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 the, the estimated one will not go. And you can see there is this term here which uh, is not zero because t is 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 fixed. And likewise, the pricing error from prices, if, from from the SDF, if you want, again, even though it should go to a small quantity. It doesn't go because T is fixed, and so this actually is probably the most challenging part because you say, "Gosh, then you know what, what should I do?" But the, the good news is that we can estimate these biases. So, in other words, I can make inference on the population property of the model, i.e., on the pricing performance of the model, netting out the biases induced by 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 fixed T. Okay, so I just and and, and I get is in a stand using standard asymptotics. And here, I think is the strongest analogies if you want with, you know, uh, you know the Giacomini uh, wide, wide framework. Again, they, they have like noisy estimates throughout, and yet they can have like standard asymptotics. They have a chi-square test of pricing, uh, pricing ability. And here I have like a sort of, a, well, a, a standard normal test uh, uh, of, of pricing performance. And so that's, that's, I guess, like the horrendous formula, but it's very simple. I'm, I'm simply 
studentizing, I'm studentizing the, the, the average square estimated pricing error. Uh, I can get what the bias, what the mean is, I can get the, the, the variance, and this guy will behave in the following way. So I you know it's going to have like the right side theoretically uh, under the null, and it's going to blow up. So you know, the power goes to one if you want uh, under this you no, know, assumably mild condition of of, you know, of misspecification. So that's for that's for delta. That's the the the, the sort of uh, expected term pricing error. And then for 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 the the SDF pricing error, similar story. Okay. So again, I get like a standard norm under the null of correct model, and and otherwise it's going to blow up. So you get power equal to one. Okay. Now. Okay, uh, I've done actually quite a bit of work on, on robust portfolio, so I, I, I thought I, I should add this, this part. Uh, but again, you know, if you're interested in pricing, you know, that not matters, but you know, if you're interested in, in portfolio construction, of course, theoretically, we know that the SDF problem is the dual of the portfolio problem, right? So in fact, you know, you can have the, 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 the portfolio mean balance uh, efficient frontier, and then the lower branch of the frontier is the SDF frontier. So that tells you how tight those two things are. Uh, anyway, the point is that, uh, again, you know, we can construct, you know, we can estimate the optimal portfolio. So here, just you, you sort of citing the usual suspects, so tangent portfolio, the mean balance portfolio, maximum mean, or the GMB. Uh, of course, uh, this is an n-dimensional object, and, and, and so each portfolio weight is biased, is noisy, okay? But the portfolio return uh, uh, you know, because it's an average of these guys, uh, you know, the, 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 the noise will dissipate and you can get a consistent estimate of the portfolio return with some bias adjustment. And therefore you have a, you know, some, you have a precise estimate of the properties of the portfolio return. So in the paper, I, you know, sort of, you know, toy around with the notion of the sharp ratio and the value risk, uh, but you can extend to pretty much any, uh, any, any properties of the distribution of the portfolio return. And, for, and, and I show you how you can construct uh, asymptotally uh, valid uh, 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 one minus alpha percent confidence interval uh, when n is large. Okay, so this is if you want to quantify, assess again the performance of your of your portfolio. Okay, so as I said, uh, I'm not good. I'm not good really quickly here. If you're interested in how to estimate the zero bid rate, so when there is no like uh, uh, when you don't allow for risk free in your in your data, you can do that. Uh, one little highlight is very interesting. Uh, it turns out that you, I, re I rediscovered the sort of uh, flipped two pass regression. So, the, the, so basically, first pass, we do a lot of cross section regression. The second pass is a single tensile regression. And the asymptotics is in N. So, it's exactly the dual of the Fama MacBeth. And you know, the theory that is there, if you are interested in that. Um, and then, okay, here, here, I simply sort of uh, want to formalize this idea that I, I've seen around many times about mean portfolio and PCA. And indeed, I, I, I show that actually, you know, uh, um, basically the using PCA, or if you construct your factor as a mean portfolio, those two things, the PCA and the mean portfolio are asymptotic equivalent. So you, do, you get the same inference, okay? Uh, which I thought, I thought was, was kind of cool. So you can see the difference is the OPN minus one. So they have the same distribution, et cetera. And I think that's actually is, is important because it really justifies uh, the use of you know sort of this heavy heavy machinery statistical to address uh, you know these uh, uh, problems in, in a surprising. I think I think that these slides tells me tells us exactly exactly that. Okay, so as I said, I have tons of empirical. So I said I have what seven minutes. So let me just go through some of them. Um, so so I'm going to of course apply this to a data set of single stocks. So I collected a, a sample of about twenty thousand stocks from CRISP. The period goes from January 1980 to December 2019, so that is recent. Uh, so we about 480, well, except 480 data points. But of course, I do conditional. So what I do, I study, I play this estimator on rolling windows of fixed T length, and I choose two T, uh, small T or two year. Uh, this is a monthly data, and a longer longer T of 10 year, which is not that long anyway. I mean, it's not still the full sample, uh, and so we can kind of to see, you know, in a way, how the conditioning is is biting, and you know, how does it does it matter? Of course, small t have a large, much larger bias, but perhaps you have a better performance in terms of economics, so in terms of pricing, in particular. Um, and so, so here, I really, no, I, I guess I probably <laughs> overdid it here. So I, I look at several aspects. So first, 
I study, is there time variation in the data? So does it matter? Because if there is not, there is no point in using all this stuff. I just take the unconditional PCA over 480 data points, and that's it. And I'm going to show you actually that there is a lot of time variation. Uh, then I started to look at the statistical performance. So what is the R square? What is the variant composition? Uh, but what the, the, the key point I think here for me is really the center part. So I want to see the pricing performance. So how does it matter? Uh, to price, how the, to, to price that's in my conditional setting, and also how do I fit the cross sectional spectral returns? And by the way, the benchmark that I use here, okay, you know, of course, the, the choice is limitless. I do two things I compare my conditional PCA with the classic unconditional PCA that you know is becoming more and more popular in asset pricing. Uh, and also, of course, I use Pharma French and compose Pharma French and five, and both in the conditional and unconditional. And, and the, the result we get are not too surprisingly in the sense that our French is designed to fit the cross section. So unconditionally, you know, we can do, do a little bit better, but not much better. So we do put both a pretty good job, but in terms of like conditioning, uh, no, I mean, there's a big, the big improvement, I think in, in my case, and, and then for pricing is even more. And then I also look at a little bit of a taste of what happens to in terms of portfolio. So I, I just construct the, sort of uh, uh, tangency portfolio. And I both look at sort of in sample and out of sample to show you what you, what you get here. Uh, then I sort of, okay, I want to see how the robust the results are. And I do both, I look at sort of large cap. So not the 20,000 assets, but the 500 assets that are making the, the SP500. And also do a bit of real time out of sample to see really whether the, the results are uh, robust. And in the paper, well, in the appendix, there is a long, long appendix with all the proofs. And by the way, I, I think uh, I, I'm going to release the paper like as soon as I finish this, this talk. So uh, maybe Eric will, 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 will make this available. Uh, there is a, also a, an extensive Monte Carlo to show you know, how accurate you could be in this large and small T uh, setup. Okay, so, uh, okay, we have a few, few, few minutes. So this is just evidence of time variation. I like these slides a lot. So this tells me, you know, using a rolling window 24 uh, data point, how does the number of, of factors uh, changes? Actually, it changes dramatically. It goes from one to 10, but moreover, it changes in a meaningful way. For example, when the market's crashing, guess what? You reduce the number of factors because of course there's this spike in correlation. And when the market is booming, there is a dispersion, right? In the market, so the correlation uh, sort of uh, decreases and you have more, if you want more, 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 more sources of risk. Um, so this is about, uh, about the loading. So again, the left hand side is the 24 short window, the right hand side is 120, I try to be consistent. And you can see that, you know, here look at the correlation between the conditional and unconditional, uh, you know, uh, loadings, because there are many factors, I use canonical correlation. The point they want, they want to make here is that there is a lot of time variation. Uh, and, and then here I try to actually use, if you want the model in a sort of, uh, I don't know, no, normative way, in a way you can say, okay, you can say latent, but you know, why don't we use my semi non parameter method to identify who are, who possibly is driving the time variation. And for example, here I usually use usual suspects. So 10 spread, dividend yield, et cetera. And, and you can see that actually these guys do matter for time variation. You can see that they matters, especially when you have a short, window so that's maybe good news if you want to build your model in that direction um and then more time variation let me just jump to uh let's see uh okay so this is a performance i mean not big here again you know you can see from the black line that there is some time variation in the performance and you know i get an r square that on average is above 60 percent and is much larger than the average of the r square clearly there is some linearity here and you know i guess we kind of beat in the final french conditional um, factors attribution. So here, we, what comes out is that the time variation really is driven by uh, by by the loadings. And so, for example, the loading has this pronounced time variation, and the and the and the factor variance seems to be pretty constant, uh, which kind of surprised me. But anyway, okay. So this is the thing, the cool part. So here, I look now. First, this slide is about risk premium. So how they fit the cross section spectral return. Again, short term windows on the left hand side, longer term windows on the right hand side. And you could see, for example, if you focus on the right hand side, you can see that. So my, my, my performance is the black line. I have the competent bounds that I use with, the, with my theory. And you see the Fama French is not too bad. It's the blue line. We know that you know, it's designed to fit the cross section. So 
In fact, in the last part of the sample is statistically not distinguishable from, from my part. He said the unconditional is doing fairly well, but not that well. But if you look at the conditional setting, really, really conditional with short windows, the difference is, is amazing. So again, you know, the, 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 the fan range goes up on and off from my, from my band, uh, which is quite narrow because, you know, it's, I have a lot, 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 lot of gen. Uh, and, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, is the performance is quite, the different performance is quite striking. But what is really striking uh, is here. So when you look at the pricing performance of the SDF, you get this, that really is like, you know, there's a big departure of using conditional as, uh, PCA, my approach, which seems to do elegantly well as compared to the unconditional approach that ignores the time variation. And I guess also from French, who by the way, are not designed to, to price asset, uh, designed, you know, to, as I said, to fit expected return. And this is not the same, the same job. Okay, I, I, for me, I have 45 seconds. So, and then here, uh, so I'm going to scroll you a couple of more slides and then I wrap up. Uh, so anyway, this is just the cross-section of, 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 of pricing error. From, from SDF and again, you know, the, the, the from French, the blue one are all over the places and our one seems to be quite reasonable. And then I have some portfolio performance. I look both at the shop ratio and, and, and the value risk. And again, you can see, I, mean, I guess you can see what, what happens here uh, in that respect. Okay, so let me just go. And, and there, is another, there are many, many tables in the paper, but I'll, 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 skip, I'll, I'll of course omit that. Uh, okay, so let me just wrap up, okay? So I tried to sort of, uh, I presented a sort of a full inflation method for conditional surprising models that can be used at low frequency data, but when T is fixed for whatever reason you want, because you, because you want to fit you know, cryptocurrencies, if you want price cryptocurrencies and N is large, large cross section, uh, is the engine is based on, on, a, on, a, on a highly dynamic uh, sort of factor model where pretty much everything is time bearing. Um, and, and, and basically this allows me to, 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 you know, to make a sort of uh, inference that is robust to uh, uh, pricing errors uh, uh, or, or, or missing pervasive factor or misspecified dynamics. And in, in the empirical, we see that there's a lot of even time variation and I think the performance, I hope you, you share with me that it seems to be uh, you know, uh, quite, quite, quite solid. And that's all I got for you today. Thank you, Paolo. Paolo. Um, our discussants, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, Patrick Gariardini. Patrick, take it. Um, go ahead, share your slides. Do you see my slides? Yep, we can see them. Great. Go ahead. First of all, thank you very much, um, Eric and the organizers, for, for inviting me to, to discuss this, this uh, wonderful paper. It was really a pleasure to, to read. Um, so um, let, me, let me start my, uh, my discussion by briefly summarizing uh, the main contributions in, in, in the paper. This is a paper, uh, as we have seen, uh, analyzing factor models for uh, a set of purposes and it makes uh, the choice, first of all, to work with uh, unobservable factors and to, to be realistic enough to accommodate for, for the time variation uh, of the betas. And in order to capture this uh, or to, to cope with this uh, dynamics in the beta, the, the, the key choice of the paper is to use principal component analysis in a setting where the time window is, uh, is short. So in this way, tracking the, 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 the time variation in, in a sort of non-parametric uh, way. So the paper has a very extensive and uh, very well-developed path where uh, the theory for, for factor, for the estimation of factor values and the estimation of the risk premium selections of the numbers of factors and many other results are, are derived. These are new results for, for the case where uh, the time frame is, is short. And uh, on the empirical side, uh, the paper is also very rich in, uh, in terms of new results. Uh, we have, Paul have shown these pictures of where the evolutions of the numbers of factor ranges between one and 10 and in general, um, the, the, the estimated model of Palo shows a superior performance in terms of pricing and, and statistical fit compared to some competitors like 
an unconditional version of uh, principal component analysis or some conditional versions of traditional uh, observable factor models like Pama French. So this is uh, a great paper. I really enjoyed uh, going through uh, this uh, this very rich uh, set of results. So there is really a lot of, as you have seen, a lot of new results in theory and in empirical findings. So I really uh, warmly encourage you to, to, read, uh, to read this paper. So congratulations to, to Paolo for this. Um, Maybe to, to very briefly um, um, uh, re re recap the framework. So this is the, the, the equation that Paul has uh, shown to us for, uh, for the asset returns and imposing the, uh, the absence of uh, arbitrage in a, in a conditional sense, uh, Paolo comes to, uh, to, to this equation in which uh, the, the capital F are sort of exposed to risk premia. So they are the, the vectors of the risk premia uh, uh, on which we add the, um, the difference between the realization of the factors and the expected value of the factors. So this is how the, the model uh, in a very general setting uh, with some variation of the alphas and the betas uh, looks like. Now, when placing this paper to uh, to the literature, we may say that we have two big approaches to to model the the time variation of uh, of the loadings. On the one hand, one approach use either parametric or non-parametric specifications for the dynamics of the data by linking them in a more or less general way to uh, to instrumental variables. And I list here all papers uh, doing this job. The approach which is followed in this paper, so the number two is rather using rumbling window uh, principal components. And uh, in particular, in this paper, uh, with a low frequency, yeah, so finity and finite numbers of observations uh, across that. So I think this is a very appealing and in some sense, a simple way to, 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 to implement some non-parametric uh, approach to the time variation of beta. So it has certainly the advantage to, to avoid potential misspecification if we are using too constrained uh, uh, modeling for, for the betas. Uh, with with finity, uh, what we can identify is the exposed risk premium, not the, uh, not the, the, the risk premium itself, with finity and low frequency observations. Um, so again, uh, in placing this paper to the literature, I think a very important part of the contribution is this uh, asymptotic analysis with uh, principal component uh, principal component uh, estimators. So in the classical setting, uh, consider the large end and, and the large T and well-known uh, long list of results about this setting. So the setting with small T is, is certainly more um, or less explored. Uh, there are some results cited by uh, the Palo in his paper uh, about the consistency of PCA with, uh, with small t. So what actually the contribution of this paper in this dimension is to go beyond consistency of, of, of this in this setting and to show how to conduct statistical inference on the estimates of the factor and how to select the numbers of factors, et cetera, keeping uh, the small t and large n uh, framework. So something which is, uh, which is very important for, for this type of results is uh, the conditions uh, that is, uh, I mean, the, the assumptions on, on, on the error terms. So, so this results old when, uh, for instance, the errors have some sort of sphericality property in the sense that uh, the, uh, the error terms are cross-sectionally uncorrelated at different time points and uh, the, the variance is, almost, is approximately constant so the cross-sectional variance is a most constant for example. So here I'm copying one of the assumptions that Paolo has. So as Paolo has mentioned, the paper has a, has a, has a, has a very, uh, very elaborated and sophisticated part in, uh, in, in the analysis of this model. And here I'm, I'm taking one of the assumptions, which I think is, is, is very important for, 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 for these results to work. So indeed, um, so if we wanted to figure out the consistency of PCA for small t, um, I found it useful in, in this paper and the other paper to think about. So if we have this model written this way, where the white T is, is the vector of the T returns of the T sample period. So it's a, it's a vector of dimension T. So this is just the, 
matrix form of my of my model. So we know that this by component is basically singular value decomposition of the variance covariance matrix of the return. So here I'm taking the large M, so the population version of this variance matrix. So in this model with finite T, uh, of course, this variance is this quadratic form with the path of the factors plus the path of the variance of the error. And, and, and the key point is basically the fact that under these uh, sort of sphericality of, of the error terms, this variance covariance matrix of the innovation is a uh, multiple of the identity. So this means that when we, we, we go for singular value decomposition of this matrix, this, this part of the error term will not change the, the eigenspace of this matrix. So in, in general, when this matrix is not a multiple of the identity, this will introduce some eigenvalues at the order of one over T, so the small eigenvalues. But in this setting, under this sphericality of the errors, the identity matrix is not going to change basically the eigenvector. So that, that's the reason for why even with finity, in this, uh, in this setting with spherical errors, uh, we have consistency of the, of the principal component. I also was a bit intrigued by, by this fact because in some sense we can look at this also from the point of view of a finite or a fixed effect panel data perspective. Uh, so let's imagine that we have two time waves and one single factor be simple. So these are the two equations in my model. So sorry for changing the, the notation that should be the X. Uh, and that's it for the second period. I've normalized the factor in the first period, time period to be one to, to, to simplify. And F is actually the factor value in, in the second parameter. So that's a sort of common parameter in this model with, with fixed T and the loadings are sort of incidental parameters. So that's a, we, we can feel, think of this as a model with incidental parameters in which we want to estimate this common parameter, which is a factor value. And so we know that in general, in such a setting, we may expect a sort of bias coming from um, incidental parameters. But the fixed effect estimator in this case, which is the, the principal component estimator, uh, we work out the, the bias and the bias is zero exactly when uh, the variances of these two errors are equal and the covariance between these two errors are equal to zero. So when we have this sort of sphericality. So in this case, actually the, the score of the estimation criterion at the true parameter value has, uh, has a zero expectation. So we have no bias from uh, the, the incidental para parameter uh, problem. So. So we can think of, of, of this property also from, from this perspective. Now, um, to conclude, uh, this ma the, the, the method in this paper is uh, essentially a methodology which, which works very well for a sort of local cross-sectional estimation of the factor models, or, or I, I think this is the way I, I understood it in the sense that it focuses on a on a, on, a, on a fixed short uh, time period. And uh, the model is, is able to achieve really outstanding performance in terms of, of pricing. So I was wondering a little bit, maybe this is a bit of a stretch in the model, but to which extent the, 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 the paper can also say something about, I mean, something beyond the, the, the local cross-sectional fit, but also the, the, the time series fit. So, in particular, I was wondering whether there is some way in which we can think of the assumptions in the paper beyond the local one, but also in a global one. So in, in the paper, we're assuming that uh, in any time window, uh, the numbers of factors is constant and we have little variation in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the loadings of, of the model. So I was wondering whether in some sense, this can be framed as some assumptions that are coherent with global assumptions uh, across through, uh, through the, the, the entire time span? I, I don't know, that's an open question. Um, I think that the, the, the figure that uh, Paul has shown to us with a number of factors is very intriguing. So this is ranging from between one and 10, and in the period between 95 and 2010, we have always above more than, than five uh, factors. 
Um, I was noticing this figure that the dynamics of the factor is quite important even a short term. So that there was a lot of changes in this numbers of factors. So I was wondering whether this large high frequency or at least short term dynamics that we see in the numbers of the factors uh, might be or not compatible with the analysis done in the paper with a T equal to 120 months or with, uh, with, with, with longer periods of 10, of 10 years because probably over those long periods, the numbers of factors is, is changing. So, so maybe this is the, the, the figures on the evolution of the numbers of factors is maybe suggesting that shorter uh, time windows might be more coherent with this analysis than the longer one. But this is my, uh, my takeaway from that. Uh, with with uh, with latent factors, of course, we always had a an issue with this uh, rotation of of rotation matrix of the factor, which in this case is window uh, dependent. And the paper adopt a uh, possible solution for that by anchoring uh, the time series of the loadings and the risk factors to the rotation uh, in the first rounding window in the sample, which is one possibility. Probably the the other one. So I was wondering whether beyond the, uh, the sample uh, interpretation, which is pretty clear of this solution, whether this, this solution of fixing this rotation in this, this normalization could have an interpretation in population or whether this, this is more something that I have to, to consider in sample or what, what is the interpretation on these and how do we deal with that when the numbers of, of of factors is time varying, and therefore some of the factors are are um, are actually disappearing in in some periods. So it means that maybe uh, I, I can think of long series of factors only for a part of the factor space, which corresponds to to, to those factors which are always there. Uh, so I think I will stop here and and again congratulate Paolo for for this very uh, very interesting paper that I really enjoyed uh, reading all these results. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Paolo, you want to respond um, a little bit to, uh, to a number of the comments? Uh, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted. Sorry, yes. Uh, well, Patrick, well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, as always, Patrick goes really deeper into, into the notion. I think you understand your paper is exactly what I wanted to, 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 to say about the, the validity uh, of, of this for like exactly for like you know sort of local how you call it a local uh, local time high large cross section uh, and that's it, it is designed to do that and it seems to perform well but of course I agree with you that you know uh, uh, this sort of opens up like a, a question mark about uh, how can think in terms of uh, of global and then something you know I mean several things can be said here because of course you know a lot given it's latent there is a lot of uh, a lot of equivalent representation for example you can you can argue that you know one can think about a world of disappearing factors, or you can think a world where globally there is a constant number of factors, and simply sometimes some of the loading just dries up, right? So this is an equivalent representation, which maybe could have maybe some appealing, and maybe could be more uh, could be more in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, of, of a global view. So yeah, this is something that uh, certainly you know to, to think about. Uh, in terms of the number of or number of select number of factors, I thought a lot actually about this stuff, and uh, and of course from my you know perhaps limited experience, we see that you know uh, the results depends crucially on the penalization, right? The penalization of the criteria is, is fundamental, and so you really have to juggle that. And I try to what I try to do, I try to see how robust the results are, and it seems to be quite quite, quite robust in respect. So 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 you know so this doesn't mean that, of course that you know I would like to rediscover you know how this is sort of. Uh, uh, rationalize the the unconditional settings, but you know, as you know, I there are a lot of non-linearity here. So the results of the local are not always the, the average of of, of 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 the long. So so it is something that you know something to, 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 to think about. So yeah, no, I guess you know you know you leave me you know as usual you know quite a, quite a number of very deep and you know sort of question marks, and I'll I'll, I'll think about about those. But I think my, I'm satisfied on the fact that you really got exactly right. Uh, what the mechanics is, and you know, and I love your your incidental parameter problem. So I, I'm probably going to borrow in my next version of the paper because it's a beautiful, a beautiful example that allows to explain really how this works to a wider, wider setting. So yeah, I mean, more than thank you so much for for the effort. I, I really cannot do that now. So thank you so much again. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paolo. Um, there is one question 
uh, from Oliver Linden, but uh, let me get to a question that from that I have actually that relates to um, yeah. some of the comments you just made. So then I'm squeezing it in. Uh, when you kind of make one of the reasons why we do rolling samples or non overlapping samples uh, when we estimate factor models is the su survivorship bias argument. And particularly since you're looking at individual stocks, um, you know, people don't want to have the full sample because that's uh, stocks that are basically survivors. Um, a, a number of things about that. So when you look actually at the unconditional PCA, you're only looking at a sample of survivors, correct? And so there is sort of this uh, apples and origins problem that uh, that you have. And also, um, when you actually make comparisons with Fama French, uh, even conditionally, I was wondering whether you can figure out how much of your uh, superior performance is due to the different number of factors, because in some of these samples, you actually have up to 10 factors and you're, you're, you're comparing that with a five factor from a French model. Uh, so uh, both for the unconditional PCA, you got all the survivors and I don't know how many factors you have versus the rolling sample conditional ones, there are time bearing number of factors. So, you know, it would be perhaps useful to know where this is coming from? Is it is it from the number of factors, the, the pricing differences, or is it the, the, the actual nature of the factors? So, okay, no, thank you. That's a very, very good point. So, so yeah, indeed, uh, there's a table at the end of the slide that I couldn't really stop where I basically compare, uh, this in terms of portfolio, but you can flip it in terms of this DF you want. You can see, like, you compare the pure out of sample uh with the in sample analysis and you can see of course that in sample you know this is that you know pca will ask you more and more and more like factors mm -hmm. with, like overfitting instead if you do if you go like out of sample you need really the timing so so you what you can do is, exactly is like by by allowing uh you know, the number factor to, to vary with the, with the cycle if you want you really do the, the timing correctly and this actually pays off in terms in terms of performance on that moreover the other advantage I think was hidden in your, in your, in your idea of survivorship is that, of course, uh, if you have the longer time series, uh, the more you have to chop up the information to get like to balance the panel, right? And so, so in fact, you know, whereas I can afford that, you know, it varies, but sometimes I really had like, you know, 50,000 stocks for, for a certain, for a certain sort of time period. If you look unconditional, you, you, you are in the range of, you know, a few hundreds. And that, mm -hmm. of course, is a massive amount of you know, infor difference in information, which I think Correct. also provides the, the performance. Does it yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Oliver Linton has a question, and I, 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 I assume you can read the chat, but I'll try to, to yeah. kind of uh, explain what he says. I mean, he basically argues that uh, structural breaks uh, are maybe not really innocent in the sense that you get, you, it's not so obvious that you can handle them well, particularly if the breaks are large because unless you know where the break is and you uh, condition your sampling cuts on that, but if your break happens in the middle of a sam of one of your rolling samples and uh, it's a large break as opposed to you know, small, slowly changing parameters, it still will affect your results. And it's a bit related also to Patrick's comment about uh, global properties. If you have slowly changing processes, maybe you can kind of handle uh, uh, breaks, uh, but not large breaks. Um, I think I hope that I did justice to Oliver's question. I, I think you did. I look at the chat. No, you're totally right. And 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 you know, I think this was uh, clearly spelled out in, in in one of the equation that uh, that uh, Patrick had. Yes, indeed. You know, I, my my word is a word of smooth changes. If you remember what Patrick point out this equation where the lambda, you know, they they they, they you know they, they they like you know they don't change very much, but because t I fix t more or less, you know. I, as little as I want, almost let's say ten or twelve. Then, you know, we can argue that you know maybe in such a small time, not much can happen. Of course, this means what I really ruin out and ruin out like the jumps. Okay, so if you if you, if Oliver, you know, I guess what he has in mind is like, so called jump component. That is 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 no, I mean, no, no, is, is a miracle I cannot accomplish uh, in that I said. But it can, I mean, possibly can be thought of. I mean, Marcus' paper is really about that, right? I mean, he's you know. Uh, 2020, he's exactly working out this, but he's he's in a high frequency domain. So so you know again, using a lot of information that I I, I don't know if, if you're low frequency you probably don't have. But yes, no, I mean I I I, I, I am in exactly 
in, in align with what you say that you know I cannot allow for like abrupt jumps in my small small team. I, my my hope is that my small team is small enough so that this you know even if there is a jump happening, you know maybe the jump is not like you know zero one zero one million. It's just you know I'm capturing maybe one part of the of the of the of the path. Uh, I think we ran out of time, more or less. I mean, this is perfect timing. Um, before we close the recorded part, I would like to say that our next uh, seminar will be, uh, we will be hosting a number of uh, uh, job market candidates uh, who will present their work. That will take place on December 13th. The information will be uh, shortly available, uh, soon available on uh, the website, and uh, Brian Kelly will be hosting the event. Um, thank you for participating today, and this will end the recorded part. Whoever wants to stay on uh, to have an informal chat, uh, please uh, join us for that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.